Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Now, today we have a very important speaker, Stefan Klaus from Austria. I met him several times participating in and also very active uh, in several in national and international conferences on Tibetan medicine. And I'm again very happy to meet him t here today. So, without much delay and uh, without uh, because when I started speaking about him, it's a it, it's a time consuming. Therefore, I would like to uh, <coughs> tell Stephen to start the session today. All the best. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I really want to thank first of all the organizers for inviting me here. It's it's great to be here. So as you can see, what I will talk about today is uh, about Sovarik Bay in Asia. So a broad picture, and I will give a quantitative overview. Um, the current emergence of a Sovarikpa industry, and by Sovarikpa I mean both Tibetan medicine, Mongolian medicine, and Himalayan medicine of different names, all of which follow the Gyushi. Yeah? Uh, so the current emergence of a Sovarikpa industry in Asia constitutes the biggest transformation that Tibetan medicine has undergone in the past several hundred years. Never before has it been practiced by as many doctors and consumed by as many patients and in as many parts of the world as today. Its dramatic growth from a relatively marginal medical tradition concerned about its own survival to a transnational industry struggling to meet patient and consumer demands has triggered fundamental changes in virtually every aspect of Tibetan medicine. Many of these changes, beginning with its name or names, um, to its clinical and pharmaceutical practices, its training, official status, and even in some parts its medical knowledge, have been relatively well studied by medical anthropological scholarship on Tibetan medicine's modernization, commercialization, and globalization. But the Sovaripa industry, as the culmination of these rather incremental processes, is not an incremental step, but a completely new phenomenon that requires a fundamentally different understanding. While Tibetan, Mongolian, and Himalayan Sovaripa remains a rich and diverse medical tradition that far exceeds mere economics, questions of value and scale cannot be ignored any longer. It makes a socio-cultural, political, and public health difference whether a medicine is practiced only by some remote communities in the mountains or in large parts of Asia, whether it is shrinking or growing, or whether it is financially barely sustainable or generating millions of dollars of profits. From an academic, professional, and policy standpoint, such data provides an indispensable foundation for understanding and working with Sovaripa today. Unfortunately, until now, such data was not available. So in this paper, I present preliminary results of several years of research conducted by myself and my team in the framework of the ERC project RATIMED, that's an acronym, and stands for Reassembling Tibetan Medicine. And this project aims to generate a bigger picture of the Sovaripa industry in Asia. In particular, I will address the following questions today. What is the size, shape, and value of Sovaripa in Asia today? What developments can we observe? And how can these observations be explained? In other words, what are the factors and reasons behind Tibetan medicine's industrial development? Another important question, of course, concerns the consequences of this development, but that would go beyond my time limit today and is in fact the topic of another paper that I presented at Harvard last year. Today, I begin with a large overview of the size and shape of uh, the entire traditional medicine industry in, uh, in, in, in Asia, then continue to particularly the Sovarikpa industry in Asia, that is especially in India, China, Mongolia, and Bhutan. I will include an overall estimate for Nepal, but we don't really have any figures from there. And I will unfortunately not include the Russian uh, part of the uh, part of the field, uh, especially Buryatia, Tuva, and Kalmykia, where there is also uh, uh, Tibetan medicine practice there. Uh, this then will lead me to a comparative policy overview regarding Sovarikpa in these four countries. Uh, before I provide a more detailed look at the figures and policies of each individual country, but before I start with that, uh, I need to make an important disclaimer. Despite our best efforts and years of research, cross-checking, and comparative analysis, the data I present today is neither complete nor, in every case, 100% 100, 100 exact. There are several reasons for this. 
One is that especially in China, the Tibetan and Mongolian medicine industries are so huge and research has access is so limited that it is impossible to get data on all the hundreds of Sorikpa companies, hospitals and pharmacies. Secondly, whatever data is available is not always reliable. Again, it's a big problem in China, but not only there. Depending on the context, figures may be exaggerated or underreported or even in extreme cases completely invented. And they, in any case, do not cover unofficial and smaller scale producers usually. Thirdly, and most importantly, there is the fundamental question of what constitutes the Sovarikba industry in the first place. Does everything vaguely related to health with the name Tibetan or Mongolian on it qualify? What about Chinese owned and operated in companies that sell single ingredient capsules of Tibetan herbs? What about the Yartsagumbu, that's cordyceps trade that often gets branded as Tibetan medicine? What about the farming business of cultivating medicinal herbs? There is no simple answer to these questions. Um, <clears throat> for example, we exclude the massive Yartsa Gumbu trade in China, which is many times the size of the Sovarikpa industry globally. But we do include Yartsa Gumbu Menjong Sorik products in the case of Bhutan, because it is sold under the label Tibetan or Bhutanese medicine. Uh, we do consider herbal products that are not classical formulas as an important part of the Sovarikpa industry. But where possible, we separate it out as, as, as a distinct category to... Uh, to not distort the picture. And we do not at this point have enough data to consider the industry for raw materials, both the wild crafting aspect as well as the cultivation, although this is certainly an increasingly important aspect. With all these cautions, however, overall I can say that in spite of an inevitable margin of error, the larger picture is clear. So let us begin with the context of Asian medical industries in general. How big is the industry for so-called traditional Asian medicines overall? and what is the share of Sovarikpa, TCM, and Ayurveda. So all the disclaimers I just mentioned are even more pertinent here, and the numbers published in various professional market reports, media articles, and academic publications are extremely heterogeneous, especially in the case of China. This indicates two main things. Firstly, that the industry overall is still relatively young and therefore quite unregulated compared to other sectors of the economy. And secondly, for the same reason, it has not been the subject of serious and sustained research yet. In any case, we can see that TCM, Chinese medicine, is largely dominating the field, although, again, to quite what extent is an open question. Depending on the source, the value lies anywhere between 31 billion US dollars on annual sales value, or 56 billion US dollars, according to another source, or even 130 billion US dollars to a third source. Um, but I should say that throughout this analysis, I take a conservative approach and favor the smaller numbers. So we stick to the more plausible, but still staggering, 31 billion US dollars for TCM, which makes up a bit more than three quarters of all Asian medical industries, not considering biomedicine, of course, which have a combined value of around 40.6 billion US dollars in 2016. Second in value are Ayurveda in South Asia and Miao medicine in China each valued here at about 2.5 billion US dollars in annual sales value and commanding each about 6% of the industry, although here again it is possible to find wildly diverging numbers, especially on Miao medicine, which according to some sources is five times larger than the entire Ayurveda industry. <coughs> but as I said, we use the smaller numbers. <coughs> as for Sovarikpa, at about 780 million US dollars in 2016, it constitutes 2% of the entire industry. And is, if, you, if you leave out the TCM part for a moment, is not lagging too far behind, actually. Uh, the other large traditions, especially Ayurveda, um, it's definitely bigger than Yunani medicine. Um, and judging by its growth rates, uh, especially in China, it's catching up fast. Uh, with this in mind, let us focus on the Sovarikpa industry more specifically. <laughs> While it may not be surprising that China dominates the industry in terms of market value, the extent to which it does is quite dramatic, as you can see. Nearly 99%, or 771 million US dollars, of the industry's overall annual sales value of 2016 was generated in China. And again, we're using conservative numbers here. It might actually be more than that. 
Less than 1%, 7.17 million US dollars, was generated in India, while Mongolia, Nepal, and Bhutan were negligible at 0.2%, that's less than 2 million US dollars, all three combined. Within this group of the small three, Mongolia is, however, the strongest and bigger than Bhutan and Nepal combined. We don't have any numbers on Buryatia, Tuva, and Kalmykia, but they would be even more small than Bhutan, I think. Now, if we break this up a bit more to make it a little less dramatic, um, Utsang, that's the Tibetan Autonomous Region, so the TAR, accounts for 217 million US dollars. That number is actually quite uh, reliable. Amdo, meaning Qinghai and Gansu provinces in China, account for 212 million US dollars. Kam, that's Sichuan and Yunnan, for about 50 million US dollars, although that is more of an estimate because we don't have a lot of numbers from there. And then there is Mongolian medicine in the Inner Mongolian Autonomous Region and adjacent provinces, especially Liaoning uh, and also Qinghai, for about 145 million US dollars. And then you see See. This chunk here, that's Qisheng, which we include. It's called Qisheng Tibet Medicine Corporation Limited. That's the largest company worldwide claiming to sell Tibet medicine. Uh, but we include that as a separate category here, not to distort the picture, because actually what they mostly make their money with is pain patches and herbal and dietary products or or heavily reformulated capsules with, with herbs. So it's not classical Tibetan medicine for sure. So how to explain this dramatic dominance of China? Simple demographics certainly play a role. About 72% of the world's Sovarikpa communities, in this case mainly Tibetans and Mongols, reside in China. But these 72% do not completely explain why China holds 99% of the Sovarikpa industry. The size and strength of domestic markets for Sovarikpa medicines also plays a role, especially a negative one in smaller and more sparsely populated countries like Bhutan or Mongolia. But then again, the Indian market is almost as big as China's, so this doesn't completely explain it. Therefore, together with these two factors, demographics and market size, we also, I think, need to look at the different national policies concerning Sovarikpa. They actually provide the key to understanding the industrialization of the uh, Sovarikpa over the past 20 years in general, and China's dominance in particular. In China, as already earlier in Mongolia, communist rule forcefully instituted, biomedicine and delegitimized, even to some part destroyed, existing health in infrastructures of Tibetan medicine and Mongolian medicine. We all know that. But uh, it was only after the economic and political reforms of Deng Xiaoping in 1978 that Tibetan and Mongolian medicine in China were singled out for state-supported development. As a consequence, in the 1980s, well, in the 1980s saw the founding of many new Tibetan medicine hospitals and colleges, and with the rising demand for medicines, hospital pharmacies began to grow in scale, but remained for the time being practically unregulated by national standards. They were regulated to some extent by the local authorities, but they were pretty much the owners of these companies because it was all state-owned and these bureaucrats and politicians were basically responsible for administering their own companies in a, in a way, so there was nothing, no regulation going on basically. Uh, in India, by comparison, we can observe actually a similar development from complete official neglect and the struggle for survival to sudden growth in the 1980s and a subsequent commercialization and partial privatization beginning in the 1990s. But while in India, Sovarikpa's development, up to its recognition in 2010 and to some extent even after, largely occurred in the absence of state involvement, in China, official policies and reforms were central, both in Sovarikpa's suppression and destruction between the 1950s and the 1970s, but then also and especially in its development and growth thereafter. My dear colleague Martin Saxa published a book in 2013 about uh, a similar topic, the industry in, in Tibet itself. He identified two stages in the development of, Sovarik, of the Sovarikpa industry in China. First, China's shift towards a socialist market economy in 1992, which came with massive budget cuts for public hospitals, including Tibetan ones, forced Tibetan hospital pharmacies to begin producing for a wider market as profit-oriented companies, 
in order to generate revenue uh, for their hospitals. This state-encouraged commercialization necessitated Tibetan drug standards and regulations because they were now uh, also available outside of these hospitals. And uh, these were hastily drawn up in 1995 and 1996, <coughs> creating an early framework for the development of an industry. In the second stage of industrialization, new economic policies in the late 1990s and a new drug administration law in 2001 introduced a nationwide system for drug registration before it was only localized or prov on a provincial level now it was national, all of China, and also mandated the implementation of good manufacturing practices, GMP, uh, until 2004. Both the GMP and drug registration required substantial investments for which private investors or large bank loans were needed, but they also promised unprecedented access for Sovaripa medicines and products to China's domestic pharmaceutical market. In combination, these two policies led to the privatization of hitherto government-run Tibetan and Mongolian pharmaceutical companies, creating the conditions for the full-scale industrialization of Sorikba in China. This can be seen well in this chart here, uh, showing the development of the Tibetan medicine industry in the TAR, so in, <laughs> in central Tibet, which, as you can see, more than doubled between 2003 and 2005, and then again doubled between 2010 and 2015. Uh, so there, there, there was a continuous growth, but especially for these two periods, of, uh, just a few years, it more than doubled. So that's, that's a huge, huge growth. Uh, and that can be directly linked to these policies. Yeah? Um, <coughs> um, Various reports from Tibetan areas and Inner Mongolia also indicate that the period now, between, let's say, 2016-17 and 2020, will see another really dramatic growth of this industry, especially following the new Chinese Drug Administration law. So they come, they are renewed every, every few years, which took effect in 2017, so just summer last year. And the gist of this new uh, law is that it simplifies the registration of classical formulas, both TCM and Tibetan and whatever other medicine, uh, but only the classical ones, not the reformulated ones, by abolishing for these drugs the requirement for safety and efficacy tests. So what used to be quite a, a lengthy, expensive and complicated procedure it has now been really simplified. And uh, so we expect this to contribute a lot to the growth of the market. Um, since the early 2000s, Tibetan and Mongolian medicine industries have become China's most important medical resources after biomedicine and TCM, but before the economically larger Miao medicine, which you see here, at, um, it's the green, uh, green slice of the pie. So although that is economically larger and, and, and bigger, in terms of public health and, and outreach and clinics and hospitals and training institutions, both Tibetan and Mongolian medicine in China are much bigger and more important. Yeah? So just economically, it's Mao, Ma, uh, Miao medicine, which is bigger. And, they, and so Tibetan and Mongolian medicine constitute both the economic and also the public health backbone of entire regions in China. Uh, so here on this slide, you, I have included biomedicine in China, the, the, the pharmaceutical biopharmaceutical industry in China, just to give you a sense of the scale and, and dimensions. Here, I took out the, the allopathic, the biomedicine side, and you can see the dominance again of Chinese medicine and, and the relative size of the other medicines. Um, and those that are mentioned here, apart from TCM, would be the main, the most important so-called ethnic medicines in China. There are many, many more, but they are much smaller, so they are included under other. Uh, so their exponential growth of these industries has, has been catalyzed by continuous state involvement in the form of new policies. So here, here you can just see the Sovaripa industry. Um, by, uh, in the form of new policies and massive government-backed investments. So this has contributed to this exponential growth. And this is actually the main reason for the uh, industrial development in China. Uh, this had the effect of a diversification of Sovaripa. On the one side of the spectrum, there are the hospital uh, factories, 
which remain outside of GMP and drug registration requirements and which produce the full range of high-quality classical formulas. So just similar to uh, in India would be Menzikang or all the, all the producers here. Um, and so in, in, in China that would be, for example, the Lhasa Menzikang factory or the Qinghai Provincial Tibet Medicine Hospital factory. They would be two outstanding examples for this. On the other side of the spectrum, there are pharmaceutical companies, many of which are Chinese-owned or registered on the stock market, uh, which commercially exploit a limited range of patented and registered drugs um, that they call Tibetan and that may or not, may not be classical Tibetan formulas. Some of them are, many of them are not. Many of these companies actually also produce TCM drugs, food supplements, or even biomedicine, and they therefore occupy the blurry outer edge of the Sovarikpa industry. Qisheng is a perfect example for this, as is also the Otachi group in Inner Mongolia, which, um, uh, which produces both Mongolian medicine and TCM and vitamins and biomedicine, so everything. And, um, and then, of course, in between these two sides that you can see here, uh, there is a very wide range of producers from small monastery pharmacies to large companies like Arura or Jigme Punzox, Jiume, uh, both in Xining, which produce quality classical formulas for use in Tibetan clinics and their own hospitals, but also other products designed for Chinese or export markets. So they have different product lines. So we can therefore make a basic distinction between production for clinical use by trained Sovarikpa practitioners and the production for large-scale sale outside the classical Sovarikpa domain, that is, for general pharmacies or shops. As we can see, the industrialization of Sovarikpa did not so far result in, the shift from, in a shift from one kind of production to the other kind, not even in China, where it is the most advanced, but simply a diversification. So this side continues, but also now we have that side and everything in between. However, it is also clear that from a market perspective, the growth potential, industrial growth potential, is much higher in the second kind, that is the herbal products and, and so on. So looking at the policies and markets, uh, that's just like an overall very basic analysis, we can say in China, we can say that in China, state policies pushed Tibetan and Mongolian medicine into the market, as I just explained. Whereas in India, it was the other way around. There, it was market forces, of course, also politics and so on, but it was mainly market forces, in, in my argument. That is, so it was increased economic value and its resulting um, attractiveness and legibility to the state that pushed it, very belatedly, into the policy domain. We can also say that in Bhutan, state policies kept Sovarikpa outside of the market for a long time, and I will come into that a little bit later, while in Nepal, it was an absence of state policies, because it wasn't, still is not regulated or, or, or even recognized there, that so far pre prevented industrial development, although now this is changing a little bit, and also there is a presence of, of course, a growing unofficial market for Sovarikpa in Nepal. In Mongolia, we can observe a mixture. State policies are there that aim to push Mongolian medicine into the market, but then there are also market forces that make it more attractive to the policy domain. But I would say that both state and market have been a little bit, a little bit weak in post-socialist Mongolia, resulting in a comparatively slow growth of the industry, as I will show later, although there was actually a big spike. But first, let's take a closer look at India. So this is the Indian picture. As mentioned above, the Indian Sovarikpa Industries industry has a total sales value of about 7.17 million US dollars in 2016. Now this number is again much more precise than the Chinese numbers, since we had, and I would like to take this opportunity actually to thank everyone who helped me and my team to get these numbers, first and foremost Menzikang, also all the other different producers that we talked to, Thank you for collaborating and sharing, and that also goes for Bhutan and Mongolia. Uh, so, so for these reasons, because we had the cooperation, we had uh, uh, this number is much more precise. And also, of course, the industry is small enough that we could personally visit most of the of the of the private producers as well um, to discuss their production patterns and quantities. Uh, almost none of them keep actual accounts 
So it was quite a procedure to ask, okay, so how much in terms of kilograms or tons do you produce every month? And then we calculate and extrapolate and, and uh, calculate with the price of price per dose, sales price, and then we come to certain figures. So again, that part of the, of the thing is, is not very exact, but it does give an overall picture. Uh, so as you can see, the Menzikang accounts for, which is both dark blue and light blue, accounts for 55% of the industry's value in India, while the other major force are about 10 private Tibetan and one Ladakhi uh, producers. Most of them are located in Dharamsala or Delhi. In 2016, the production volume of classical formulas, now if we only look at the classical formulas, the, the proper medicines, that was more or less equal bet oh, sorry, between Mentikang and the private pharmacies. So you can see the dark blue and the red patch uh, or a slice of the pie is, is almost exactly the same size. What made the difference for Mentikang was its sor uh, sorry herbal products, um, which, which is this part of the pie and which overall then increases the figures of Mentikang. Uh, <clears throat> so, so the sorry products amounted to some 22% of the Mentikang's annual sales value that year. I've been told that the usual or average value might be higher, it might be around 30%, but that year it was 22. Since the herbal products have a much higher profit margin, however, their share in Mensikang's annual profits, not just sales value, but profits, is much higher. Speaking of profit margins, these, uh, these are another reason for this comparatively small size of the Indian Soviet industry vis-a-vis -vis China, because in a country like India, where there are still relatively high poverty rates in the rural areas and no national health insurance that would cover Sovaripa, as it does at least partially in China, Mongolia and Bhutan. It does make good sense, not only from a social and public health perspective, but even from a business perspective to keep Tibetan medicines affordable and profit margins low. So the profit margins are much higher on the, in China and that is also why that contributes to the size of the Chinese industry in terms of uh, sales value. Now, then we also have Ladakh and Sanskar, uh, and there the largest single producer of medicines is the Ladakh Amchi Saba. And besides that, there are about five other Amchi who produce sufficient amounts of medicines to sell to others outside. Besides these, there are over 100 village Amchi who at least partly make their own medicines, but they usually do not sell to others. So as with Qisheng, that Chinese company on the other extreme of the spectrum, this would be the, the, well, the other extreme of the spectrum and it's questionable whether this can be considered part of the Sovaripa industry or, at all or not because nothing about these producers in Ladakh is actually industrial, right? But their production in any case is so minuscule that it hardly matters statistically and we included it here. The same is true in terms of quantity for Chakbori and CIHTS, although both of these, from what I hear, are planning to expand their production volumes significantly in the near future. Um, in terms of the industry's development in India, we can see that Mensikang is growing steadily in terms of patient numbers and uh, medicine production. So the blue line are patient numbers and the red line is the medicine production in lakhs of doses. I adjusted the, the units of measurement just to keep both graphs more or less in the same range, otherwise there would be a big gap between them. But uh, it's interesting to see um, how they correlate or not. And although it is, we need to be careful when analyzing these graphs, because what they do not show is um, who these patients are. Yeah? For example, there could be, for example, a decline in Tibetan patients, but which is more than made up for in an increase in Indian patients, or, or some other dynamics that might be going on, you cannot read out of this graph here. And similar actually with the medicine production graph, it might have to do with the weather or leftover stocks from the previous year or any number of reasons, yeah? But still, uh, two general points could be made. Firstly, we can see that despite some fluctuations, the gap between medicine production and patient numbers has decreased uh, compared to the mid-2000s and especially around 2010. So this is where it was the highest, also here. But overall, it decreased. So the gap between medicine production and, and patient numbers is less than it used to be. Um, 
so despite an increasing concern about shortages of medicines, there are more medicines available per patient than there used to be. Of course, these again are just overall numbers and says nothing about particular types of medicines, which may indeed be in short supply while there is a surplus of others. Secondly, given the strong demand for Tibetan medicines in India and also around the world, the Menzikang's growth is rather slow. You know, this is not, it's not a steep, steep increase here. It, it, it is increasing steadily, but not very fast. Um, there are several factors for this, including human resources, raw material availability, the policy situation, both within the Mansikang, also within the CTA, the Central Tibetan Administration, and also nationwide in India, limited facilities, and even, as I said, the weather, because it's quite wet in Dharamsala. Um, sorry. Unfortunately, we do not have a multi-year data on private pharmacies in India to compare the growth rates, but it is clear that uh, also there the demand outstrips the supply, which means that they are not growing as fast as they could, uh, and again for many of the same reasons as Menzikang. Uh, so to sum up, while India's Sovarikpa industry is the second largest after China, mainly thanks to exiled Tibetan efforts over the past half century, it is also clear that it remains at an early stage of industrial development. Dominated by one large institution, which is sometimes a little unsure about its role and direction, and held back by a lack of national policies and regulatory frameworks, as we've heard this morning, it's not included in the Drugs and Cosmetics Act, for example, as well as a host of other structural factors, it actually, in the foreseeable future, has little hope of competing or catching up with its counterpart in China. However, the data also in indicates a strong potential for growth, given the strong demand, India's huge domestic market, and the small but high quality infrastructure of Tibetan medical colleges, and also recent access to significant government funds. Furthermore, since Tibetan medicine's globalization started from the exiled Tibetan community in India, at least the second wave of globalization, I should mention that the first globalization wave for Tibetan medicine actually came from Mongolia. But, but the more recent one came from exiled Tibetan community in India, and therefore exiled Tibetan doctors and producers still dominate the international market. Although, again, also this advantage is shrinking fast given the massive scale and rapid development of the Sovarikpa industry in China, as well as the emergence of other actors such as Sorikang International. Let's turn to Mongolia, which is an interesting case and often underestimated, or even just simply forgotten when we talk about Sovarikpa. Of course, at slightly less than 1 million US dollars of sales value produced in 2016, the industry there is very small. But still, it's the biggest of the three small Sovarikpa countries, which include Nepal and Bhutan. Like Tibet for Tibetan medicine, Mongolia is the center for Mongolian medicine, with strong connections to the ethnically Mongolian regions of Siberia, Buryatia and Tuva, as well as to Inner Mongolia. Its medical education infrastructure can easily compete with the industrially far more advanced in the Mongolia, in China. And in terms of international presence, Mongolian medicine from Mongolia outcompetes its Chinese counterpart. This is not the only similarity with Tibetan medicine in India. Structurally, the industry is likewise roughly divided in two halves, if you, as you can see here, except that here uh, the division is between official, sorry, official and unofficial producers. Um, since Mongolian medicine is integrated in Mongolia's national health uh, system and at least partly covered by national health insurance, and also because Mongolia is very, very actively cooperates with WHO in the field of traditional medicine, uh, official numbers exist to some extent, so this half of the pie is actually, the numbers are very precise. We've got the exact numbers. Um, uh, at least as far as the overall size is, is, is concerned. Uh, but that is only five to seven companies, and these numbers completely ignore the unregulated sector, which consists of one or two major producers, and uh, which are equal in size to the official companies. And by the way, it's also interesting that these official companies are all more or less equal in size, yeah? So there's not one that totally dominates. Um, and then there are a lot of dozens of smaller producers, uh, most of which are based in Ulaanbaatar, but not all of them. <clears throat> uh, 
what is more, even the official companies uh, may tend to underreport their earnings for tax reasons or other reasons by up to 30 percent. So uh, we included a certain estimate for this underreporting in the unofficial uh, part of the half of this pie here. Um, so which means that actually the companies, companies listed on the right side uh, will probably be take a little bigger share of, of, of the industry overall than, than is depicted here. Uh, the development of the Mongolian Sovarik industry is also interesting because in contrast to India and China, after a phase of strong growth, especially between 2006 and 2013, as you can see here, um, it shows stagnation and even some decline more recently here. Um, and you can see, oh, yeah, so the blue one is the volume in terms of 10 kilos of medicine production. We lack some, some figures for some years. Uh, and then the annual sales value uh, is given in Mongolian Tugrik, the, the Mongolian currency in red, and in thousands of US dollars in green. So just again for comparative purposes. And um, what we can see here is that the growth until 2013 is more or less consistent or even better than uh, the development of Sovarikpa elsewhere, especially in India. But it is connected, and, it, and this is connected to government policies regarding Mongolian medicine. So, for example, hospitals have to offer Mongolian medicine services. And also, uh, between 2009 and 14, uh, this was a period of, of extreme economic growth of the Mongolian economy overall. They, it grew by 70% during that time. So that also, of course, affected Mongolian medicine. And also an increasing public interest in, uh, in Mongolian medicine. In 2013, the Mongolian medicine industry's growth nearly came to a standstill. Um, it still kept growing a little bit in, in actual Tugrik value, but it declined in uh, US dollar value uh, due to dropping exchange rates that year. And then in 2015, uh, Mongolia's recent uh, severe economic crisis set in and also a period of political instability that also continued into 2016. So, um, and during that time, at least two official Mongolian medicine producers, so two companies, stopped their operations. Uh, and this is the main reason which, uh, which impacted the, the drop in output and sales value here. Um, uh, last year, however, in 2017, the economy stabilized a little bit. And also two new factories have opened officially. Uh, which uh, one of which is included here, that would be this one, Oritan, which has a small, small part here, small section only, but that's only because they only started that year. Uh, and uh, I expect the numbers to grow quite a bit more. So I think that we, we are facing significant growth again this year, uh, is, uh, especially in the official sector. In terms of policy, the situation is ambiguous. Far ahead of India, Mongolia has included Mongolian medicine in its official healthcare system and passed several policy and development strategy papers and documents since the late 1990s. Especially the recent years have seen significant developments with the introduction of GMP requirements for uh, Mongolian medicine producers, a drug registration system, and the publication of a national Mongolian medicine pharmacopoeia last year. While initially the government's agenda uh, that's my interpretation, uh, I hope I'm right, but that's what I could see was more focused initially on Mongolian medicine's integration into the national healthcare system. And over the years, this gradually shifted towards a focus on developing an export-oriented Mongolian medicine industry. Indeed, with a very limited and at times, as we saw, uh, even shrinking uh, domestic market, international expansion is becoming increasingly important, and about 30% of Mongolian medicines produced in Mongolia are exported to Russia and Eastern Europe, especially Poland, where over 200 Mongolian doctors practice. However, the Mongolian Ministry of Health has surprisingly little knowledge of, and almost no resources for, the Mongolian medicine industry. So without being accompanied by financial and political support, these policies, not all of them, but some of them are perceived either as inconsequential or as an additional burden for the already struggling producers. 
Mongolian medicine also stands in an unequal competition with the mining industry in that country, which accounts for a significant part of the country's GDP, uh, both in terms of political support and natural resources. So that is increasingly felt that the uh, parts, large parts of the Mongolian countryside are destroyed or poisoned by mining companies and making it harder to find sufficient quantities of medicinal raw materials. <coughs> Finally, a few words about Bhutan, which is also a unique case, as Sovarikba is completely nationalized there, uh, which means that there is only one official producer and provider of medicines, and that's Menjong Sorik Pharmaceuticals, or MSP in short. It also means that there are very exact and reliable figures available, and thank you for that uh, to the concerned people. Uh, and uh, also it means that these numbers are low, not only because Bhutan is a small country, but also because as a government institution, the aim is, or at least was, not to make profits, but to provide high-quality medicines at low cost for the uh, national healthcare system. So in 2016, MSP had a total re revenue of uh, 347,000 US dollars. Of the total sales value generated that year, about 76.5% came from medicines. As you can see here, so the blue part is medicines, and the red part, again, is commercial products or herbal products, uh, like beauty creams, uh, herbal capsules, tea, incense, uh, yarza gumbu, and so on. Uh, of all countries, the Bhutanese numbers fluctuate the most, as you can see here. It goes down, up, down, up. So it's actually impossible for now, for this period we have here, to identify any trend of sustained growth. So MSP's output moved between, as you can see here, 9 and 13 tons of medicines. Uh, and just to compare, that's a size that's roughly equivalent to private Tibetan pharmacies in Dharamsala, which operate out of hired family houses with a handful of Indian staff, right? Uh, needless to say, this output falls far short of demand, especially since Sovarikpa is completely integrated in the, into the national healthcare system and also covered by health insurance. So here, you can see that since 2011, production has never covered more than 60% of the demand. So the, the, oh, the demand is the red bar and the actual production is the, is the blue bar. So the blue bar has never been more than 60% of the actual demand and sometimes even, um, even, less, uh, even less than half, right? So this on the one hand illustrates the chief reason why MSP uh, became a corporation last year because the hopes are that its pro productivity will increase uh, if it's not a government institution anymore. And on the other hand, it also indicates a, a very large growth potential. If they actually manage to inc increase their production, the demand is certainly there. They can increase uh, by 100% or more. So let me conclude with a brief reflection on the broader trends that we can observe. Uh, first and most obvious, China completely dominates the industry in terms of value and output. Although this has not yet translated into a Chinese dominance in Sovarikpa's global representation and identity. In this regard, India, especially the Tibetan community here, and Mongolia still have an edge, and academic exchange and conferences like this, like this one today are instrumental, actually, in sustaining such representational power. However, here too, the Sovarikpa community in China uh, is catching up fast, as the Tibetan Medicine Conference last year at Harvard uh, impressively indicated. Secondly, and contrary to many fears, our data indicate that Sovarikpa's industrialization does not lead to an overall decline in quality, neither of products nor of medical knowledge, although of course this can and does happen in individual cases. So I'm not saying that it's all great what's happening, but it also definitely does not mean that the good quality producers suddenly disappear or start becoming bad quality, right? So they continue, and they continue successfully. Instead, we observe an increasing diversification where classical Sovarikpa coexists with purely commercial-oriented companies or individuals, and practitioners of, and products of the highest quality also coexist with those of the lowest grade. At this point, however, the market is big enough for everyone. Um, thirdly, this diversification also leads to a blurring of boundaries to other medical traditions, including biomedicine, but also TCM, Ayurveda, etc. 
I have mentioned companies that produce both Sovarigpa and Chinese or even Western medicines. Some produce slightly reformulated Chinese drugs and label them as Tibetan, uh, or the other way around, they produce Tibetan drugs and, and sell it as Chinese medicine. Many Tibetan and Mongolian doctors nowadays offer acupuncture as part of their own medicine, which is, comes from, from TCM. So such fluid boundaries are actually a key characteristic of Asian medical industries in general, and one of the reasons why the more fixed notion of medical systems isn't very helpful in understanding what's going on, because that notion of medical system uh, assumes very clear-cut boundaries. Here's this one tradition, one system, and there's the other system. But what we observe with these industries now is that uh, the distinctions are very fluid. One merges into the other at the edges, at the outer edges, like Qisheng. Um, and that is also actually the reason why it is so difficult to quant quantitatively gauge these industries because, because it is very hard to decide what to include or what not, which numbers do we include, which numbers we don't include, which companies which include, uh, we include and which ones not. And fourth, and finally, uh, while the growth of the industry depends on many factors, uh, the data I presented indicates that national policies are crucial. It was massive state intervention, both political and financial, that drove Sovarikpa's rapid growth in China. It was the absence thereof that slowed its growth in India until now, and government policies also had a definite impact on Sovarikpa's development in Bhutan and Mongolia. Policies, of course, can help or harm, and most of them do both at the same time to different degrees. But if all the charts and numbers that are presented today uh, show one thing, then it is whether we like it or not, and whether we actively participate in it or not, the Sovarikpa industry has become big and important enough to actually shape and transform Sovarikpa as a whole, even those parts of it that seek to remain outside of the industry. So it has become impossible to ignore it or avoid it, but it certainly can be shaped through both practice and policy. Thank you. Thank you for such a wonderful speech. And I think we, the Tibetan students, Sovaripa students, as well as the Tibetan Amjis, should also learn something from this data. And in, in the future, I hope that there will be more presentation from Tibetan Sovaripa practitioners in such kind of data. And thank you for being here. Because yesterday I was talking with Dr. Katochi, and he said to form an international cooperation is also very important. So this kind of such presentation is also, I think, is very, very important. Organizers, do we have time for questions, or maybe don't have that? Huh? Yes. Uh, thank you for the presentation, of course. Very good. Uh, the, I still didn't get it. Is it um, ex-factory prices, or is it market prices? Market prices. So for the factory, we have to divide it grossly by two. Yeah, it depends, yeah, but yeah. OK. I mean, of course, some factories never sell on the market. They just directly supply their clinics, so, you know, but, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, I have to miss major part of your presentation, uh, but uh, I can understand by your uh, conclusion that uh, what kind of situation is there. Uh, so I have one question, actually. It is regarding, uh, did you ever assess the raw materials? Uh, like raw materials like in Delhi or whatever, or many places, most of the time it goes from Delhi mm. or India. Mm. Like in, when I went to China, that time I also asked them. But they said majority of uh, them are coming from India by <laughs> Nepal route. Okay. So you have also assessed that the uh, raw material, this thing, scenario? Yeah. Uh, we we certainly have, have done research on that. And I can I can say that I know exactly everything that's going on, but we have a quite good idea, at least on some areas, especially India, to some extent also China and, and Tibet and Mongolia, but uh, not in numbers, not, not quantitatively. That, that is too difficult, actually. Uh, also because part, large parts of it uh, are not quite official, at least in some of the countries. In some others it is official. Um, I also I can tell you that especially in China they are far advanced in terms of cultivation 
don't ask me what exactly they cultivate. Uh, if it's just, uh, you know, five different species that are easy to cultivate or if it's something more interesting. But anyway, it's, it's, it's a huge industry in itself. Like thousands, tens of thousands of farms just in one uh, district of Kham, yeah? Let's, uh, in, in parts of Sichuan and Yunnan, actually the, the, the main economy is that uh, of the region, of, of growing medicinal plants and supplying the factories. Um, and the same in Inner Mongolia. Uh, but then, of course, you have the problems of pesticides in them and, and, and these things. From what I know is also they are beginning to set aside areas in China uh, where they don't cultivate because some of the high altitude plants are difficult to cultivate and I don't think they've figured it out yet. But it's like thousands of hectares where it's like a protected area particularly for these plants, they naturally grow there and uh, uh, collection is regulated so that to prevent overharvesting and so this area would be set aside just for that purpose. Now in Mongolia also they have a very well organized system. I don't think they set aside areas but uh, everybody who wants to collect, every doctor or producer who wants to collect medicinal plants first needs to specify exactly to government agencies how much, where, when, etc. And then the whole thing is checked again after they actually collected the stuff and it checked in labs and so on. So it's much more regulated there. Um, and in India, not so much. Like, uh, even you can say in Ladakh, 70% of the ingredients goes from Delhi, Amritsar, Jammu, all these plain areas. Hmm. Likewise, in uh, Tibetan parts of China and Nepal and Bhutan also, many of the ingredients might be going from Delhi or some other sources. Like I told you, 70% <coughs> of the ingredients we are taking from other outside Ladakh. Yes. Uh, yes, although I would, I'm not sure if that's true for China. Uh, in China, they have huge medicine markets in mainland China, uh, and more or less the same things grow in China that grow in, in India, so I'm not sure how far they rely on India. In Mongolia, they import from both, so that's interesting, from both India, so all the plants that don't grow in Mongolia either come from China or India. Um, so it's interesting to talk to Mongolian producers about what they, how they perceive the differences. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. I think the CCTM member wants to offer you a moment. Thank you so much. <laughs>